Why should you be careful when discussing religion or politics while you're in the city of Prague? We'll be discussing the strange relationship between the denizens of Prague and Windows this week in Footnoting History. Hi, this is Kirsty, and welcome to the July 6th edition of Footnoting History. Now, you may remember back in March, I was talking about a guy by the name of John Wycliffe and Alice Rowley, one of his followers. If you missed it, feel free to go back and catch it. I'll wait here. It's okay. All right, so I promise this is actually related to Prague and Windows. As it turns out, Wycliffe not only had an English audience, he also had quite the following in Czechoslovakia. There was a man by the name of Jan Hus, who took a lot of Wycliffe's ideas and incorporated some uh, concepts of nationalism into the mix, and so created a pro-Czech, anti-Catholic, heretical sect called the Hussites. Now, Jan Hus himself was actually tried in Constance in 1415 and killed, but his sect continued on. Obviously, this caused a bit of tension with the Catholic Church, which continued to grow uh, politically within the country until the 30th of July, 1419. On that day, Jan Zelewski led a Hussite mob to the new town hall in order to free two people who had been imprisoned by Catholic authorities. Zelewski was a charismatic rabble-rouser of a preacher, he actually turned the mob over to Jan Zizka, who led the mob into the town hall and threw seven council members out the window to their death. Now, as you can imagine, this was not exactly a popular action with the authorities, and it sparked the Hussite Wars, which continued into 1436. During this time, the Catholic Church called several crusades against the Hussites in Bohemia, all of which failed, uh, and the Hussites, after some infighting, were eventually able to negotiate a pact with the Catholic Church that allowed them to retain a lot of their right. What this means is the people of Bohemia, particularly the Czechs, learned that throwing people out of windows can be a brilliant maneuver for starting a fight. They liked the idea so much, in fact, that less than 50 years later, on the 24th of September, 1483, another group of Hussites decided that the Catholic authorities in both the old and new towns needed to change. And so they got together and threw the old town Port Reeve out the window, along with seven aldermen from either part of town, and caused their deaths. Now, this defenestration doesn't necessarily get a lot of airtime, really, because it didn't start a war, like most of the other ones, and it didn't necessarily change a lot in the city of Prague. It has, however, garnered the somewhat amusing title of the one and half defenestration, since it occurred between the first defenestration that we just spoke about in 1419 and the second defenestration, which occurred in 1618. The official second defenestration of Prague was a response to events that actually started in 1617, namely the election of Ferdinand II, a very Catholic Habsburg, to the position of King of Bohemia. Now, Ferdinand II did not have a particularly conciliatory attitude towards the Protestants under his rule, and so he began tightening the controls on religious variations in Bohemia almost immediately upon his succession. Given that the Czech ethnic group was by and large already Hussite, this led to a lot of political tension and resistance within the Kingdom of Bohemia. However, this was not unique to Bohemia. Tensions across Europe in the early 17th century were growing, and the power balance within the Holy Roman Empire, of which Bohemia was a large portion, was becoming increasingly unstable, and the balance between Catholic and Protestant princes was daily pushing towards conflict. On the 23rd of May in 1618, then, Count Willem Slavada, Count Yaroslav Martinez, and a secretary by the name of Philippus Fabricius 
all found themselves in the chancellery with several other Catholic nobles to debate the validity of the building of Protestant churches on royal lands with several of the now deposed Protestant leaders. The Protestants wanted to prove that these men were responsible for convincing the King of Bohemia to renege on agreements to allow these churches to be built. The men were found guilty and thrown out of the third-story window to a drop of 70 feet. Given the success of previous defenestrations, the fact that these men survived was actually probably a bit of a shock. However, they landed in a pile of manure outside the window. Or at least that's how the story is told. There's also potential that they just were protected by their coats and the fact that they fell on a slope. Catholic supporters touted this as a miracle granted by the intercession of either the Virgin Mary or a choir of angels. Protestants perhaps found a little more symbolism in the fact that they'd fallen into a pile of manure. Either way, this was the opening volley to what became the Thirty Years' War, an intensely complex and difficult thirty years to wrap one's head around in the period of European history. The Bohemians were able to expand their war into the rest of the Holy Roman Empire, calling on support from Protestant princes in the rest of Germany, as well as making a pact with the Ottoman Empire in order to oppose the emperor. Eventually, the Danes and the Swedes and the Frenchmen and the Dutch all decided to get involved in this pan-European mayhem, and we end up with what I would actually call probably the First World War. The Bohemian Hussites, now Protestants, had once again picked their fight. By the Peace of Westphalia in 1648, Bohemia had not obtained its independence per se from the Austrian Habsburgs, but it had gained the right for Protestants to practice their own religion regardless of the faith of their leaders. And really, from the beginning, that's what they were really interested in. Now, this brought in a lull in the use of defenestration as a political tool for quite a long time. However, there is one remaining incident that sometimes is called the third defenestration of Prague. Well, in our sort of timeline, it might actually be considered the fourth defenestration of Prague, considering the one and a half incident in 1483 that we discussed. This incident is a little bit unlike any of the previous defenestrations of Prague because religion actually had nothing to do with it. Instead, in 1948, a gentleman by the name of Jan Maserek, the son of Czechoslovakia's first president, was found dead outside his apartment bathroom window only two weeks after a trip to Moscow in which he had been pressured to keep Czechoslovakia out of the U.S. Marshall Plan. Maserek had served as foreign minister for Czechoslovakia's government in exile during World War II, and he retained that position after Czechoslovakia's independence had been established following the war. The question remains whether this was a suicide or whether he had been assassinated by the KGB. There are authorities that weigh in on both sides. People who knew Masaryk said that he probably committed suicide as a publicity uh, stunt, essentially, to uh, bring attention to Czechoslovakia's plight against the might of Russia. Others, including an official investigation in 2004, argue that Russia was, in fact, involved in this death. If that is the case, that this shows that Russia was capable of learning from the Czechoslovakian people and began using their own tactics against them. Czechoslovakia did fall under communist rule for a great many years, but Masaryk's death did actually create a level of unease in the West, and less than a year later, NATO was formed to resist the spread of communism through the rest of Europe. In a way, then, this final defenestration of Prague did also start a bit of a war, but in this case, the Cold War. 
Though we tend to think of Eastern Europe these days as being somewhat divided and perhaps not as uh, central to European politics, I think the defenestrations of Prague show that the events that occur here in Eastern Europe often have a greater impact on central politics than you might expect. And perhaps we should be keeping an eye on Prague for any further window incidents. This has been Footnoting History. If you like the podcast, be sure to visit our website, footnotinghistory.com, where you can find further reading suggestions related to this week's podcast. You can also like us on our Facebook page and follow us on Twitter at History Footnote. Join us next week for the next installment in our Revolutionary France series, when we'll be looking at the personal life of Napoleon Bonaparte. Until then, remember, the best stories are always in the footnotes. See you next week!